So hi. Um, I know that I'm the thing that separates between you and lunch, so I'll try not to be too over time. Uh, this talk is Java 8 and Beyond, the Scala story. My name is Itai Zeidman. This is my Twitter handle, Itai Z. I'm a back end engineering lead at Wix. We're a website building platform for those of you who don't know us. We have over 90 million users. So please go and check us out. Uh, I've been a clean code fanatic for quite a few years now, and I've been a Scala lover for the past two to three years. Other than that, I'm the proud spouse and father of three. These are my girls. Okay, so a bit of preface. Java 8 was released in 2014. Now, it doesn't feel like that, but that's actually two and a half years ago. Now, for a lot of people, it, it begs the question, is Scala still relevant? For me, the answer is a clear yes. But I know that many of you are not convinced. So this talk is about convincing you. Quick agenda. We'll talk a bit about history. And when I talk about history, I mean Java 7. Now, it doesn't feel like history, but it was released six years ago. So that's pretty old. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the Java Scala gap, uh, Java 7, how Java 8 reduces it, and remaining gaps. Then we'll take a deeper dive into traits, type inference, pattern matching, and implicits. OK, so the Java Scala gap pre-Java 8. So Scala's big selling points were lambdas, uh, which were very rich and uh, uh, very second in, uh, in their syntax. You can just embed them everywhere. Uh, a very uh, uh, useful collections library, which allowed you to map, flat map, uh, span, filter, collect, whatever you need to do uh, for a collections library. Um, Scala has had that for quite a few years. Traits, and by that I mean mixins, the ability to add uh, multiple implementations, partial implementations into your uh, class, type inference, DSLs, and implicits. Now, uh, Java 8, of course, the big selling point of Java 8 was lambdas, and uh, you could argue a bit about the syntax, verbosity, but uh, definitely Java 8 brought lambdas front and center into Java. The collections library was also mitigated via the streams API. So yeah, you now you need to go back in, in and out of streams a lot of times, but you can get um, most, if not everything, that Scala's collections library gave you. You can do that with streams API. Now, traits, many people think that Java 8 now has traits because of default implementations and interfaces. We'll drill down into that and see why that's just incorrect, but uh, that's how people perceive the Java Scala gap now. So see that even in Java 8, we, see, we, we still see three big selling points in type inference, which reduces verbosity. DSLs and implicits. Now, I won't be touching on DSLs because that's a whole topic by itself. But uh, just to give a taste, DSLs is, is about the, the ability to embed a domain-specific language inside the host language. So if you're working, for example, with uh, mechanical engineers and you want them to write some of the code, then uh, a language that supports DSLs gives you an easy way to uh, embed the constructs of the language where, where they can go and talk in their own domain. Uh, and uh, Scala has um, a big support for that, mainly because of operator overloading and, um, and other features, advanced features. Okay, so actually Scala has a lot more features than that. That's just the high level. Now, some of, the, some of these are more uh, advanced Haskell kind of uh, file, um, type system uh, features like path-dependent types and higher kind of types, but a lot of them are really useful in the day-to-day. -day. So such as for comprehension, flexible scoping, uh, plus conversions. So, okay. So I might be right, but why should you care? Uh, I took a few examples that for me as a Java developer were uh, annoying, unconvincing, and I tried to see, to, to show you how Scala streams lines them and makes them more comfortable. So traits. So this class is a class that I'm sure that you have hundreds, maybe thousands of class, classes like that, right? It's a class, it's a class that has 
uh, some logs and it has a, a method that has a totally synthetic example that normalizes a string and, and normalizes a name of a person. So it gets the name, it uppercases, and it trims. Okay, so anyone can tell me two big problems that exist in this code. Yeah, which which one do you mean? Like because so okay so so yeah um, that's actually a matter of flavor. I I personally agree with you, but a lot of times uh, people add a lot of logs. So let's let's assume that these log lines are actually needed. Okay, so, so I, I think that actually the, the usage of, of info and debug, that is, uh, that is the attempt to say when it's uh, needed and when it's not. Uh, so, but, uh, so one big problem with this code is boilerplate. We have these three lines in each class, and they don't really differ, right? They only differ with respect to the class. And you have them all over you need to keep the to keep writing them, and I don't know how many of you were around when SLF4J and logback came to the scene, but we wanted to move from log4j to SLF4J, and now we needed to go over each class and replace them, press the, the, these lines, right? These APIs, although they're not really material. So, boilerplate is one thing. Any other thing? So we actually have eager evaluation here. Okay, you see that we're creating that string, normalizing, plus person dot to string. Now, when you're writing a high throughput web scale web server, these things start to amount. Okay, these allocations, these unnecessary allocations, because I hope you're not running with debug uh, level on production. If you're running on debug level production, you have other issues. But assuming that you're not running with debug level, then we have here eager evaluation. Now, there are ways to handle eager evaluation in Java, right? How, how, how do people do it today? Hmm? Yeah, if log is debug enabled, right? So if, if we'll go down, down that route, what we'll actually get is we'll get We'll have now one, two, three uh, log lines. So we'll actually get nine log lines, right? Because the if and the closing for one business value. So we'll have one line of business value for 10 lines of log noise. So, okay, so that's one uh, handling. Does anyone know a different mechanism? Yeah, okay. Let's wait to the, the big guns. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like lo lo local tools. AOP is, 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 uh, is a tool that can help you solve this, but uh, it introduces its own costs of, uh, of cognitive load. Now I'm a developer, I need to know what things operate on my code and so on and so on. So much more local. So, so let, let's wait with lambdas in a sec, because definitely lambdas can help us with, with this eager evaluation. But I'm talking about marker templates, okay, or string dot format. A lot of people, a lot of times people use that. Um, but that can introduce new problems, because you might get to production and see that you have too many parameters, or too few parameters, or a mismatch between the types of parameters. So now you might want to start writing tests for those templates, and um, you're off in, 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 a, in a bad direction. So let's see how we can improve that with Java 8 or with Scala. So this is the ideal. We'll have a class that just implements a logging, and this will be lazily evaluated. So let's try to see if we can do that with Java 8. So OK, default implementation. Is everyone familiar with default implementation? 
Okay, I'll, I'll give a sentence just to make sure. So default implementations basically means that you can now have implementations in interfaces. Now this has uh, a lot of limitations. So first of all, you can't have fields in interfaces, but we need the logger instance, right? Okay, so we'll add a getter. But actually, now we still have all that boilerplate, right, inside the code of the logger factory and of the imports. Now, another thing is that you can only have public methods in interfaces. So now your logging API and the getter, the logger, is visible. So someone can go and add a user to your user service and can debug a message on that logger. Okay? So, problematic. What about lazy evaluation? So, like this gentleman said, yes, that, that can be done with a Lambda. Uh, Java 8 brought with it a few functional uh, interfaces, one of them being a provider, a supplier of, of T. And a supplier of T just supplies you with, uh, uh, with the value when, when asked. When you do message.get, for example, here, then it's evaluated. But it comes with a bit of a cost of a boilerplate in the call site. Okay, you see you have to do the parentheses of the lambda and the arrow and so on and so on. So let's see how this can be done with Scala. Okay, so Scala traits allow fields. You can just have that logger inside encapsulated. They participate in the life cycle. So when the uh, encompassing class gets initialized, it gets initialized with it. And when it's destroyed, it gets destroyed with it. It supports visibility. Now, I won't be able to do in this time slot. Uh, I have a bit of extras about uh, scoping and visibility. You can check that out in the GitHub repo afterwards if you want to. But suffice it to say that Scala has a very, very rich uh, visibility story. So you can scope, uh, you can scope things to a lot of a lot of uh, uh, packages. You, if if you have com Wix example, you can scope something to only example, only to Wix, only to com. Uh, with uh, inheritance, without inheritance, so on and so on. So Scala traits has all of these. They are first class citizens. It supports multiple inheritance. So if we want to have logging as a trait and we want to have serialization as a trait, we can have both of them. Now, I won't be going into how uh, the diamond, uh, diamond problem is solved. It is solved uh, at compile time. But uh, if you want to check it out, just write Scala diamond or talk to me afterwards and we'll try to get into details. And the last kicker is that we have this. You see that uh, colon and then the arrow? This allows us to have by name evaluation. Okay, so at the call site, we have the regular um, um, syntax. It looks like it's eagerly evaluated, but actually what happens there is that the Scala compiler wraps it for us because we ask it to be a by name evaluation, and only when it's evaluated inside the method, then, uh, then, it get th then the content is evaluated. So we get the value of, the, uh, of reducing the noise in the call site, but also uh, the lazy evaluation. Any questions about traits? OK. So type inference. So type inference is the analysis of a program to infer the types of some or all expressions, usually at compile time. Now, I like to think of it as a balance between compile time safety and verbosity. OK? So I, um, I like the, the safety that uh, static type languages give me, that I know at compile time and very fast if I'm correct. But I also like uh, the, the dynamic languages, the fact that you can focus on the value, okay? Oh, you can focus on the names, you can focus on what you're trying to achieve. Type inference tries to give that balance of reducing the types wherever it can and uh, still keeping you safe at compile time. So let's, look at, let's take a look at Java. Does Java have type inference? So it, you're right. You're totally right, yeah. So it has, uh, it has many people don't understand that, but actually Java has type inference for generics. It, the compiler will fail you if uh, you're trying to call a generic method with a type that doesn't meet, uh, match the upper or lower, lower bound. 
It also has uh, type in first uh, since Java 7 with uh, Project Coin. Okay, I, I, hope if, I hope you're running on Java 7 and above, and I hope you're using it because it does reduce the verbosity. Now let's take a look at Scala. So Scala has, of course, the generics, the local variables, which means that you can omit entirely the, the left-hand uh, side of the type. <coughs> In most cases, of course, not for the, the RH cases. And for method return values. So let's take a look at a bit of code. Oop. Okay, now please, if in the back, I, I don't think there will be a problem here, but if there's a problem, visibility, tell me and I'll pinch and so on and so on. Okay, so let's split it and okay. You see that IntelliJ is so used to the noise that it collapses, it tries to show you what's important, right? So we have to use these very elaborate uh, tools. So this is something that right, you all know, a list of a string names, arrays, s, list, Joe, Dan, Moshe, okay? You all know this. And this is, this is in Scala, okay? You just have a val, and it's inferred. We have a sequence of Joe, Dan, and Moshe. And the compiler can understand that this is a sequence of strings, because that's just what we uh, assign to it. Okay, so a small example. Let's take a look at another one. Hmm. Yes, and Scala. Okay, so uh, let's say we want to add two ints. So we need to define a by function of an integer, integer, integer adder and give it an A, B, and then say it's an A plus B. And then when we want to use it, we just do adder dot apply of five uh, and seven. In Scala, what we have, first of all, we have a lot of different ways to do that. Um, that's part of what's good and sometimes problematic about Scala. So you can do a lot of things in different ways. So this is uh, really not the idiomatic way. I added it here just to uh, streamline us from Java to Scala. So you, you, you don't use type inference. You do say, what is the type? It's a function two of int, int, int. And um, this is how you define the lambda in Scala. And we just use it. So even here, we don't do need, need to do the dot apply. But let's move to more idiomatic versions. So one of them still doesn't use uh, type inference, but uses a more uh, um, smaller way to represent the function. So we just say it's a function from int int to an int. And the last one, which does use type inference, just defines it. OK, we say this is, this is a function from two parameters, a int, b int, and it adds them together. And we just apply that. OK? Now, these two examples seem small and isolated, but they add up inside the code base. When you go into a class and you start seeing vals, 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 vars, OK? First of all, it's, uh, you, you immediately see when th something is not immutable, okay? when something is not final. Second, you start to take a look a lot more about the names because they pop out. Now, I do want to show a small caveat um, about because I talked about method return values, right? So method return values uh, gives a lot of value when you use them within private methods. Okay, so when you use them within private methods, you can play around with the return type and you control everything. So it's okay that uh, you want to change this type to that type because you control the whole compilation unit, right? When you, when you use that on a public uh, method, you might leak information. So let's take a look at this example. We have a trait. For example, a trait is uh, an interface, okay? So we just have the method, do your thing, and 
we have, uh, let's ignore what ca case object. For now, this means that this is a singleton. Okay, singleton provided by the language. You get one instance without the need to do double locking and so on and so on. So you get a singleton that actually works out of the box. And we have a cook that extends a profession and uh, overrides diff do your thing. And when it's asked, it, it says, he says, here's your asparagus. And other than that, uh, he implements another uh, method for suppliers that returns a secret ingredient of a whole lot of secret love. And we have another singleton, the police woman, which extends a profession. And when asked to do her thing, she says, I'm watching you. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, our example. Uh, extends app, when you say extends app, basically what this means is the body uh, gets run and public static void main. Okay, so I can just run this. And, uh, and these lines, th these print lens, these print lens will just, uh, will just run. Okay, you see here. Okay, here's asparagus. Now, when we, when you encapsulate and we say about the, this method, we uh, specify the return type, we don't use type inference, then what we get is the correct encapsulation that we want. Because if you'll try to use that method, you don't have accessibility, right? Let's see, cannot resolve symbol, secret ingredient, because you have a profession in hand. But if you uh, use the type inference here, then actually anyone can just use the secret ingredient. Okay, so this is a small caveat about when to use um, method return values and when not to. Uh, an additional point here is that it's less documenting. So when you have private methods, you can count on yourself usually to take a look at the flow and understand, okay, this is what I'm returning. I'm returning here a sequence of strings and then it transforms to sequences ints and so on, so on, so on. When it's a public uh, API, you want people not to be forced to drill down into your code and read your code and understand that code to see what they're getting back. Okay, questions about type inference. Excellent. So pattern matching. Uh, it has no arbitrary expressions, by which I mean guards, the ability to say case something if some condition about something, okay? And it's a statement, so you don't have result values. Now, we have ways to work around that, right? It's not, these are not unsolved problems in Java. So workarounds are ugly. You can either have nested control structures. You can say case, right? And then if something else, something, and returns, of course, and breaks. And uh, to get typing, you can encode enums, right? You can map a type into an enum. You can use the classes. Just do dot class, and uh, path, you, you can uh, switch on the, the, uh, on the class. But that's ugly. So pattern matching in Scala, it allows arbitrary types. So you can work with any type you want or need. It supports guards. You can do case something if it's of type this and it's, uh, I don't know, 2 a.m. It checks for exhaustiveness. And this is one, one of the killer features, OK? It, there are areas that you can use this, uh, and I'll, in, in the code sample, I'll get a bit more in, onto where it, uh, it, it fits uh, really well, but basically this means that you get a compile time warning for cases that you're not uh, matching on, okay? And it's user extensible, which complements the arbitrary types, and it's ubiquitous. And by that, I mean that it's all around, okay? Be it uh, synthetic sugar in all kinds of other complementary constructs or in uh, libraries that I encourage you to do pattern matching. Questions? Okay, so let's take a look at code. Okay, so.
to start us off, we'll start with our Java example. So, oh, let's let's take a look at the domain for a, for a second. Okay. So this is our domain. Okay, we have a, we have an interface, a trait, an animal. Doesn't define any uh, any methods. Let's ignore the case for a sec, and uh, I'll, I'll I'm. I promise to get back to it. And let's just say that we have a class dog that has public final fields called name, string, and can be taken for a walk boolean. And that is an animal. Okay? And we also have a cat that has a name, string, and that extends an animal. Now, let's get back. Whoop. Okay. So we have, uh, we have uh, Lucky the dog. We have Bonnie the dog. And we have Philip the cat, and we want to take care of our pets. Okay, so take care of pet, gets a vargs of animals, and uh, wraps that. Remember what we talked about too. You can use streams, but you have to pay that uh, ceremony of getting into a stream and maybe get out of a stream. So you have a stream of a pets. Sorry. And for each, we want to take care of a pet. Now, I don't know what about you, but I dislike this syntax greatly, but it works, okay? So this is a method reference. Uh, for those of you who don't know basically what this means is for each animal, this method is called with, uh, uh, with the animal, okay? So th this is instead of saying, uh, take uh, like the two animal, yeah, something like this, right? Yes, the lambda, so we just use this, okay? Java 8 standard. Oh, sorry. Now, this is where we get to the atrocity. So we get an animal. Now we want to uh, switch on that animal. So what I needed to do is write another static class in an animal enum factory and an animal enum of a cat and a dog. And here to say, if animal instance of cat, return animal enum dot cat. Else if animal instance of dog, return animal enum dot dog. Now, in the else, I could have thrown an exception. I return null. Your mileage may vary what you want to do here, but for our uh, example, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so what we get is we get an enum out of this, and now we can switch on it. And we can say case cat, repentland, I hope you appreciate, I let you pet me, because you know, pets are con because cats are condescending. And you have to remember to break, okay, because I forgot to break, and then I got, I got a, a, a casting error. And if it's a dog, then we say if, and we cast it here, if the pet is a dog, then can it be taken for a walk? We print then going out for a walk, or we print then thanks for petting me. Okay, and then we break. Okay, so this is the, this is the ceremony that we have to do. The, the casting, and the if, and the break, and uh, the resolving. So let's take a look at this example in Scala. So, you see, we have the same three pets, okay? We have Lucky, Bonnie, and Philip, and we take care of pets. Now, this is very similar, although again, without uh, because Scala, uh, this, by the way, what uh, is another feature that lends itself greatly to DSLs, okay? You don't have to use the dots and the parentheses, so we just say pets, space for each, space take care of pet, and that's it. So. We take care of pet, and we just say animal match. Case cat, if it's of type cat, print then, I hope you let, I pro hope you appreciate, I let you pet me. Case dog, if dog can be taken for a walk, then print then going out for a walk. And otherwise, case dog, dog, print then thanks for petting me. Um, so, so we see here the guard, and we see here the types that are embedded in, into the pattern match. But okay, I added a lot more features, and this is pretty basic. So let's take a look at a few more examples. Yes, definitely. Sorry, sorry? No, okay, okay, so good, good question, thank you. No, so this if is part of the condition 
of whether to execute this, this case or not. So this is the guard. This is exactly the feature that says this, these conditions need to be met. So it's not only the type that needs to be met, but also this if, this guard has to return true for this, uh, for this lambda to be executed, okay? We, we can run this, by the way, and just, just see that I'm not you know, bullshitting. So you see, I hope you appreciate I let you, oh, sorry, thanks for petting me, okay? So thanks for petting me is the first dog, Lucky, which can't be taken for a walk because he's too old. So he actually skips this case and gets to the third case, okay? I have a question here. I have understood that case dog plus the if are in fact the entire condition. This is the entire condition, yes. yes. Uh, if I would say case dog, case dog without any condition, would I have a compile error like I have in uh, Java? Uh, first of all, I, I don't remember. Let, let's take a look, okay? Let's just take a look. I think so, by the way. Yes, unreachable code. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. You? Okay. No? Just a small question regarding the code. Is uh, some kind of alternative for break in Scala? So, um, not really. Okay, you, 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 you can return, uh, but this is not, so, okay. Wait, case, this doesn't get evaluated, so the, the, the break is actually implicit, okay? So once, once a case is, is caught, that's it, it won't try to evaluate more cases, okay? So uh, you might ask the, 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 different, the different question, because if, if you can't break, then can you do catch all? L not catch all, but multi-catch, right? Like to do case, uh, case cat, case dog, and then to do the handling. So no, um, I actually, so first of all, you can't do that with a guard. Okay, you can, you, or not, not with God, sorry, but you can just extract that, for example, into a method and call the same method in both cases. Um, but when I, when I, by the way, I thought about this also question about when I made this, when I prepared this talk, but I haven't found a really useful example for catching uh, both cases inside uh, the, the, same, the same switch. But no, it does not. So. Uh, yes, so we are here. I want to talk about a bit about exhaustiveness. So, okay, exhaustiveness. We have our domain here now, family members. So, this. So we have four family members. We have Mary, the mother. We have Joan, the mother. We have uh, Josh, who's the eldest, and we have Jane, who's the youngest, and they're all family members. Now, how is that different? So, yeah. So case object. Um, again, let's ignore the case for now. And as I said, the object, remember, this is a singleton, okay? So we have just one uh, Mary mother, and that's just, just for convenience, so I can use them without doing a new, okay? Um, so we have, we have here a sealed trait. What does a sealed trait mean? Okay, this is what enables the exhaustiveness. This tells the compiler that all inheriting uh, classes and instances, okay, and instances if, if they are singletons, have to be declared inside the same file. What does that give us? It gives us the ability, it gives the compiler the ability to say, okay, this is the universe. These are the family members, and now I can tell if you're actually handling all the cases. So what we'll see when we'll try, okay, so we have a method feed family, and we want to feed the family. Now, let's compile this and see what the compiler says. The compiler says match may not be exhaustive. It would fail on the following input, Jane Youngest. So it actually gives us, it tells us the line, and it says, hey, here, you are not matching exhaustively. If on production, Jane will want to be fed, you will have an exception. Now you can decide to handle it or not, because I can say, no, I know Jane is on summer school, right? So she won't be coming to dinner. I can do that. It's okay. 
And if I'll run it, indeed, oh no, sorry, I'll run to run it. I actually have to tell IntelliJ to run this. And you see we're running it on Mary, Joan, and Josh, then we're good. It was just a compile time warning. But if Jane was sick, for example, and she came back from, uh, from summer school, then we get an exception. Because the, the runtime basically says, hey, I'm, I, I, I match error, okay? I tried to match Jane against all the cases, but I could not. So you need to handle that. But the compiler tried to warn us beforehand, and that, that is the big kicker. Yes. Are you obliged to declare your class sealed and put all its descendants in one file? It can be huge, really. No, okay, so uh, not all instances, okay? Not, so you can declare instances of the inheritors, of course, throughout your program. Uh, but the, 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 the classes have to be declared in the same, uh, in, in the same file. First of all, in Scala, so that is why when it beforehand I said that uh, it doesn't apply to all domains. It works when you have a relatively small uh, domain, okay? But because Scala is, uh, is the opposite of verbose, okay, because it's so succinct, and so you can basically, even if you have 10 or 15 inheriting uh, cases inside the case, in, in, inside the same file, it's, it's, not, it's not too much. Uh, uh, above that, then, yeah, that, that would be problematic. And of course, it, it, there are a lot of domains that you don't know all instances, right? You, not instances, but you don't know everything that will inherit. So that is irrelevant. That is, th this works well for data types uh, that you understand it's a closed universe and you wanna say, okay, this is what, 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 will, have, what will happen on production. Um, just a small thing to, to understand is that this is, of course, not limited to simple cases, but also to cases where you say, okay, if you want to say, basically, you want to do, you want to do uh, child extends family member, and this, then this extends child, and this extends child, and let's say feeding children, and we want to say here, so now we won't get a compile time warning, okay? Because the compiler understands that both Jane and Josh are, uh, are in that subtree of children, okay? So this underscore, by the way, means something. Like, I don't care, okay? Yeah, you can think about, no, it's, it's, it's not default in the sense like in the, 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 the switch statement. It just says, I don't care about the value. Here, I cared because I wanted to bind it. I wanted to use it inside the string interpolation. String interpolation gives you the ability to basically uh, embed variables and uh, commands inside, uh, inside the strings. Okay. So, yes, one last example about pattern matching. So we talked about user extensibility. So now we have our domain as a user. It has a name, an age, and an email, okay? And we want to match against that. So we have Danny, who's five years old. We have Joe, who's 32, and we have Fabio, who's 13, okay? And we say sequence of Danny, Joe, Fabio for each great user. Again, just notice the simplicity of, of defining whatever you need. So greet user. Greet user matches on a user and says case user if its name is the literal Joe, okay? So here we bind the, we bind the name and say if the name is the literal Joe, then we wanna say print and hi Joe. If it's a user whose age is 13, then we wanna bind the name and use the name and say congrats Fabio for your bar mitzvah. Okay, you see here the string interpolation that uses the name and if it's a user that we don't care about the name and we don't care about the email, but we only care about the age, then we can use the guard and say if under age of age, and here under age means that you're less than 13, then we say sorry, no entrance, you're under age. 
So this is very similar to the guard that I showed you before, but I want to show you an example that uh, the, it just uses a method, right? It can be whatever you want from the class, okay? So it doesn't have to be like an expression embedded inside the case. Um, yes. Okay, so, so it can be whatever you want, and we can bind these. Now, how does this magic work? Because we talked about user extensibility. So this works by basically giving the, the, the runtime uh, a, a deconstructing or decomposing method. Okay, so by convention, for a class, if you want, if you want your class to work like that, for example, your class is called user, then you have a singleton object with the same name by convention. This is called then the companion object. The companion object has a def unapply, okay, or decompose, that gets a user that might be null because we're working with Java and we might get null, and returns an option, like optional of Java 8, right? It might be or might not be of a tuple, a string int of string. These are the, the fields of a user. And what do we do? So we say option of maybe null user. Let's just understand that this is short circuiting. So if it's null, we don't continue, okay? If it's not null, then we say, okay, give me the user. Now, I just return a tuple that says user.name, user.age, user.email. And when we're running here and we're matching, then basically what happens here is a call to the companion object to the unapply. Okay, so you take the user and you call this method, okay, and you get back the tuple, and then it's matched against that. So, remember I, I kept telling you the case, ignore the case, the case class this, case class that. So what does the case class give you? So it gives you a few things. It gives you, uh, it gives you equals hash code to a string by default. It gives you uh, the fact that you don't have to say that your, your uh, fields are public and final and a constructor. But it also gives you a companion object with an apply and unapply. So, I'll comment this out, and you see this doesn't compile, because it doesn't know, cannot resolve method user.unapply. Okay, but let's say this is a case class, and remove this because this is redundant. Yep. And you see, it just recompiles. And also, I don't have to do this new. Why? Because what I get here now is this is a call to the apply method, okay, the corollary one, that gets a sequence of Danny, Danny the, 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 the fields and uh, constructs a user instance, okay? Okay, so I think we'll have to rush a bit with the implicits. Let's hope I'll make it. Okay, so uh, implicits. Implicit has a lot of use cases in Scala. Some of them uh, are more controversial, some of them are more mainstream. I won't be touching all of them, partly because I don't agree with all of them. Uh, I tried to pick two use cases which are really canonical uh, and, and annoying, at least in Java. So the first one is passing class info, or using generics. Imagine you, you need to call Jackson's uh, deserialize, right? Okay, and you have a string, and you want to say it's a foo. What do you do? You say deserialize foo.class, right? And you have to pass in all of those uh, classes and class of t and class of t and class of t. Okay. In Scala, you can, it supports implicit parameters. Now, you can do it with implicit parameters a whole bunch of things. Um, this use case is pretty simple because the compiler is the one handing you the implicit parameters. Okay. They are filled by the, comp are filled, uh, by the compiler. Okay. And you have a compile time error if they can't be, uh, can't be filled. And of course, there are well-defined rules, somewhat complex, but well-defined rules for the implicit search. Other use case, and, and we'll take a look at code in a sec, okay? Other use case is to enhancing third-party code. So um, in Java, what you do is you have verbose wrapper methods, right? So usually, let's say you want to add the method to Spring. And you go to the mailing list, and you go to the GitHub, and you talk to them, and they say, okay, let's add this method. And they say, no, we don't want this, it's bloat. 
but you have to have this method. So what do you do? You usually do like spring utils, and you add a static method that gets those spring instance, and that's what whatever you want with that code. Okay, with Yoda, Spring, whatever it needed. In Scala, you have implicit methods. So in effect, it looks like you're working the same instance, but you can enhance the library. And that is also verified at compile time. So code. I'm sorry I'm rushing a bit. Last time I did it, I had an hour and some change. OK, so first, OK, so the domain. Okay, strange. Never mind. Okay, so this is, I renamed this class already. Uh, so th this, just for to make it clear, this is not my class. This is a, this is a class that is comes from Spring, and I can't change it. Okay, it's here just for an example, but I can change it. Okay. Now, in Java, what you do is, sorry, I'm talking nonsense. We're talking about the class tag. Talking about the class tag. And if we want to deserialize our domain, then we say up. Then we say deserialize some domain. And we need to give again the class, some domain object. And this is, I think, stuff that you already know, right? This says that this method is generified by T. And you get a T and a class of T. OK? And then it does something. Uh, all together, and you need to, and you can print them. Okay, so how does this look in Scala? So in Scala, you just say this is an implicit, okay, class tag of T, and the compiler gives you this. It takes this information that is usually erased, right, with, with type erasure. It's erased uh, in compile time and embeds it as an implicit uh, parameter. And then you can just use that. You just say class tag dot runtime class. And there are all kinds of other methods on class tag, on the type tag. And uh, you can start to explore kinds of more advanced type system kind of things with, uh, with the help of the compiler. And when you call it, you just say deserialize of some domain object. So you just say one time what you want to happen. And that's it. No repetition needed. OK. Enhance my library. Yes, one minute. OK, so let's see. We want to add accumulate. And no, he's in, in the front. He's in the front. Accumulate. So uh, we just say a dot sum and b dot sum. OK, so this usually sits in like a utils class. And uh, you call it statically and so on and so on. In Scala, how this looks is you just have this instance plus another instance. Or you can say an instance accumulate other instance. Now this works with an implicit class that adds this method. And once we import this, then uh, the, the compiler understands that what we want to do is actually in this implicit class, it takes our spring instance, it, it turns it into some other class implicitly and allows us to invoke accumulate or plus, and I won't go into detail now, but why to add both symbol and English. And I'll just wrap up. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll be here, by the way, most of the day and after, so we can go into questions afterwards. So Scala's relevance. Post Java 8, I hope I've convinced you that basically there are, are a lot of gaps still, uh, still there. Towards Java 9, I was in Java 1 uh, two weeks ago. Um, not, not a great uh, deal is going to happen with respect to the Java language constructs. Maybe, maybe local type in inference, probably not going to get into Java 9. Java 10, great question. Um, they might, they will definitely get uh, local variable type inference, and they might, uh, they might get pattern matching in. So it's like unconfirmed and so on and so on. They have, they're working on something like case classes with the equals and two things and so on and so on, but pattern matching is still undecided. So thank you for listening. We're hiring in Kiev and Yepro also. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, come talk to me. Thank you.